It's been eight years now since Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 was shot down in eastern Ukraine, killing 298 people on board, including 38 Australians. Overnight, a Dutch court found three pro-Russian separatists guilty of the atrocity. Here's the latest from Seven News. The judge describing their deaths as cruel. The court convicting three men, two Russians and a Russian sympathising Ukrainian of murder for their part in ordering the Russian uh, book missile to come across the border from Russia to uh, rebel-held eastern Ukraine, escorting it on its journey and then sending it back to Russia, attempting to cover up the crime once it was discovered that it was a commercial airliner that had been shot out of the sky by the missile. For the dozens of Australians here who were in the court listening to the verdict. It has been an emotional journey. I also feel sad though. Yeah, because, you know, for all of us it doesn't change anything, so it's a measure of justice, but um, it would be complete justice if our family members were restored to us. Just a shocking atrocity. Let's bring in Tony Abbott, who was Prime Minister at the time and led the international charge to get a proper investigation. Thanks for joining us, Tony. First up, a, a great relief to see that verdict, but what chance of those three men ever being brought to book? As a result of the verdict, Chris, they are now really international fugitives uh, if they ever leave the sanctuary that the Russian dictator is currently providing them. And while it was uh, uh, for mid-level people who were on trial in uh, the Netherlands, uh, the real perpetrator of this atrocity is, of course, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Russian missile batteries don't cross borders by accident. Uh, it only happens if the Russian leader provides that authorization. And as I said to him in the celebrated shirt front discussion, uh, not long after the atrocity, uh, he really does have to accept responsibility, apologise, uh, pay reparations to the families, but as is well known, instead of accepting any responsibility back then and subsequently, uh, he went into a long rant about Ukrainian provocateurs, about the Ukrainian government being fascists uh, and about Ukraine not really being part... Uh, really being part of Russia and not an independent country. So... What we really saw back then uh, was that 38 Australians were the early victims of Putin's first invasion of Ukraine. And what we're seeing now is a continuation of that process where he's trying to finally exterminate Ukraine uh, as a free and independent country. There's no doubt we can see that now as a precursor to what's unfolded with the full invasion. Just reflecting back on when you fronted Vladimir Putin on this and, and, and he gave you that sort of nationalistic rant that we've become used to from him. What was your sense of the man and his knowledge of what had gone on here? I think he knew exactly what had happened, but uh, this is someone who, uh, wherever and wherever he can, uh, ruthlessly pursues uh, his goal of trying to recreate greater Russia, the Russia of Peter the Great. Um, and if that means invading other countries, if that means murdering his opponents at home or abroad, uh, he'll do it. Now, it makes sense by his perverted logic, uh, but the horror of this is that he's been able to get away with it now for uh, two decades. And frankly, uh, the best way to see justice for the families of the 298 victims of Putin on MH17 uh, is to help the Ukrainians to win this war because only a deeply chastened uh, Russian leadership is going to surrender the people responsible for this atrocity. Are those two objectives merged now then, as you suggest, uh, because, of course, there's quite an international coalition putting pressure on Russia now over the Ukraine invasion. There are really pretty severe sanctions in place. Is there anything additionally that the international community, community can do in light of this verdict to put a, more pressure on Putin to hand over these three men? Well, I think the best thing we can do right now is to intensify our efforts to help Ukraine. Uh, we can train more Ukrainian soldiers in Britain and in Poland and good on the Albanese government for agreeing that Australia will help to do this. 
uh, we can provide more sophisticated military equipment and uh, we've got something like a thousand Bushmasters mouldering in a depot near Brisbane Airport. Uh, we've sent fewer than a hundred of them to Ukraine. Uh, why not send uh, a couple hundred more uh, to a country where they could be useful? So I think we just need to do uh, more than we're currently doing and everything that we reasonably can uh, to try to ensure that the Ukrainians are able to prosecute this war uh, to a victory. And really, uh, the only acceptable outcome is the complete expulsion of the Russian invaders from all Ukrainian territory. Just on the current government's attitude to Ukraine and more broadly on foreign policy, Lord knows I've got plenty of criticism in other areas, but are you pleased in the way that Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong and Richard Miles have continued to support the effort of the, in Ukraine, have continued to stand up to China in our region and have also doubled down and confirmed that they will, uh, they will go with the nuclear submarines and the AUKUS agreement? Look, uh, I uh, obviously uh, have uh, the usual difficulties of a uh, centre-right uh, a former Prime Minister with a, a centre-left government. Uh, but I've got to say that uh, the Albanese government has been at its best so far on uh, defence and national security issues, and long may that be the case. Well, on those, uh, I played at the top of the program the latest bit of gratuitous advice we've got from the French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, suggesting that one of the reasons we should have taken his uh, yet-to-be-designed diesel-powered submarines is that China would have been more relaxed about them. What would be your response to President Macron? I think that's an extraordinary double standard uh, from the French President. Uh, it's OK for France to have nuclear-powered submarines, but somehow... If Australia gets nuclear submarines, uh, that's a threat to global peace. I mean, it was a pretty bizarre statement uh, from someone who still seems to be suffering sour grapes over the fact that France was uh, really not able uh, to get us what we needed uh, on time and on budget. All right, uh, just uh, let me go to another issue that I suppose impacts to a degree on national security, but it's, it's more of a domestic issue if I could, if I could just throw uh, an additional topic at you, and that is energy policy. Uh, we know that Anthony Albanese and uh, Chris Bowen are doubling down on their commitments to the UN in terms of getting to net zero and reducing emissions. They're saying that they're going to address our domestic cost and supply crisis with additional renewable energy, yet the energy regulator tells us this situation is going to get worse at least for the next two years. Just how dire could our energy crisis become in this country over the next two to three years? I, uh, I fear it's going to get much worse. Um, all of us want to reduce emissions as far and as fast as we can, but not if it means uh, the lights going out and not if it means uh, massive job losses and the continued export of our manufacturing industries to less fastidious countries overseas, uh, such as our great strategic rival, China. Um, I really think that uh, uh, the government uh, is, is creating a dreadful problem for itself. Um, we can see in Europe before our very eyes uh, what happens if you over-rely on unreliable, intermittent renewable power? Um, they're frantically trying to get more gas. They're frantically trying to reopen coal-fired power stations. And yet we're desperate to shut down the coal-fired power stations that currently give us some 60% of our power with no substitute. I cannot think of a more counterproductive policy or a greater exercise in economic self-harm. Yet Anthony Albanese today has tried to use Europe to justify what we're doing. He's saying European nations realise they're caught uh, light on for supply and they're doing everything to boost it. But as you say, they're boosting it with coal, with gas and with nuclear expanding in, uh, in the UK and in France and perhaps being extended in Germany. I mean, we, this country is floating on gas and we haven't been using enough of that uh, and do we need to go down the nuclear path as well? Well, it's, it's truly bizarre that we are prepared to export our gas, but not to use it here. We're prepared to export our coal, uh, but not to increase our 
use of it here. Um, we need power 24-7, not just when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. Uh, and that's the reality that uh, so many people, uh, from the current energy minister uh, to the woke capitalists who have taken over so many of our energy companies, need to understand. Tony Abbott, thanks so much for joining us as ever. Thanks, Chris.